she was a, a matriarch, of course. Um, she was a loving, nurturing, caring person. She was a, a mother, you know, taking care of her children. I'm Veronica Robinson. And I'm Lawrence Lax, firstborn of Henrietta Lax. My name is Victoria Baptiste. I'm Alfred Lax Carter, Jr. I'm the proud grandson of Henrietta Lax. Henrietta Lax um, was born on August 1st, 1920 um, in Clover, Virginia. She um, later on had started a family and her and her husband decided to move from the tobacco farm, which they grew up on, um, to Turner Station in Maryland for work because a lot of the men there didn't have a lot of opportunities for work in the South. So they came um, to Maryland to work in the steel mills and things of that nature. Okay, I was born in Clover, Virginia, and I came here around about, ooh, ooh, when I was about five or six. When you came from Virginia to uh, Turner Station, that was a time of migration. It was a migration period and a lot of people were moving their families, a lot of African Americans were moving their family so that they could have a better life for their children. So people would come from Virginia with nowhere to go and even without having space, they would open up their home. My mother, Deborah Lax, she was only two years old when Henrietta passed away from cervical cancer. So growing up as a young girl and a young adult, my mother was curious to know different things about her mom, such as what was her favorite color? Um, did she like to dance? Did she like to sing? How did she wear her hair? How did she dress? Just everyday things that we take for granted when we're around our family members. She was not just a cell. She was a wife, a mother, a friend. She was a community activist. Yes, my grandmother, Henrietta Lacks, was diagnosed with cervical cancer. Um, she went to Johns Hopkins Hospital for treatment. At that time, she didn't have a lot of options as, as to where she could go get treatment because she was a person of color. And, you know, the socioeconomic background also had a lot to do with how many options were available to them at that time. Um, so she sought treatment at Johns Hopkins Hospital. In our family, we believed that we never told stories on the dead. But imagine having someone you lived back then, the practice being that they sold radium to her cervix, mm -hmm. burning her from the inside out. I know she had a lot of pain, but she tried not to let nobody know, you know, but she's tried to stay to herself there up a, in the bedroom, you know, crying, different things like that, you know, but, uh, you know, I, you know, act like I, got, I, didn't, I didn't see anything to, you know, so I try to help her out as much as possible. What I do know is that it was suffering on both ends, not just for Henrietta suffering, you know, going through that radium treatment and how her, uh, how the tumor cells metastasized so quickly, um, but for her family not to be able to have those last moments with her and having to only be able to see her through the window at the hospital. Oh yeah, I remember that more, more than ever really close because I'm the one who had to take care of her, you know, help her sleep, help her get things, food. I used to go do the cooking, cleaning, and I was all around maid, you know, down during that time. So uh, yeah, I helped her get better and, and you know, and try to keep things going for because nobody else was there to help her. October 4th is very significant because October 4th, 1951 is the day Henrietta Lacks passed away at Johns Hopkins Hospital. We later found out that they had taken, um, they'd used her cells uh, from her tissue sample um, without the family's knowledge or Henrietta's knowledge and were able to have the first cells to be cultured outside of the human body. These cells um, came to be the HeLa cell, which um, created so many advancements in medicine. Like the polio vaccine, and today the um, HPV vaccine, and also COVID-19 um, vaccinations. The Dr. George Guy did a presser on the same day that she passed away 
on the steps of Johns Hopkins Hospital to let the world know that he had the human cell line HeLa. He never acknowledged that the HeLa cells came from Henrietta Lacks, which is very significant. And to me, in my opinion, it's, it's very disrespectful for him to have a press release on the same day that Henrietta Lacks passed away and not acknowledge her. It was actually quite by accident that the family initially learned about the cells being used um, at Hopkins. Um, my grandfather's wife, Bobette Lacks, um, was actually at dinner at a friend's house. And, you know, when she, their introductions were being made and they introduced her as Bobette Lex, um, the gentleman that was there said, Lex isn't a familiar name, that's not common. Are you, do you know a Henrietta Lex? And um, she was like, that's, that was my mother-in-law. And then that's how she initially found out that, hey, we've been using these cells at Hopkins, you know, for research. And they came from, you know, Henrietta Lacks. And that was the first, um, one of the first initial ways that the family found out about that. The world recognized her as Helen Lane, Henry Lawson. They refused to say her name. They didn't want people to know that the HeLa cell came from a black woman. Uh, born in Virginia that migrated to Maryland um, because they thought that if people knew that this cell came from a black woman, they would be reluctant to get the polio vaccine and everything else that people needed to exist in those times. Um, but throughout that, the family did not know for many years, over 20 years, that her cells had been, been, had been being used in research for all that time and all the advancements that were able to be made from them. The HeLa cell line is important because it gave doctors and scientists a way to test for vaccines, um, which helped everybody around the world. And then to know that a part of her still existed and was making such a big impact all over the world um, was, it's also, you know, something that we want to gift like we like, we love that. We love that she was able to help so many people around the world in, lose, in us losing her. But it would have been a lot more, uh, it would have presented better for closure um, for the family and to have something to hold on to if they had just been aware um, or someone had um, the thought, the forethought or the empathy to tell the family that, you know, during the same time they were announcing to the world that they had these great cells that they found and they were making all these breakthroughs with. Um, if they had just taken a moment to at least explain that to their family and what that meant. It means a lot because, you know, equity is something not only for Henrietta Lacks, but for people all around the world. Uh, so this is a way for our family to take back the narrative of her, her legacy. Um, because so many other people tell the story for us. With the family to advocate to get this word out and get this story out about Henrietta Lacks and all our accomplishments that her healer cells has made, she will say a job well done. Because just like my mom wanted to know who her mother was, we are letting the world know who Henrietta Lacks was because she has been dehumanized by a lot of people. Um, all they're concerned about is the HeLa cell and the advancements and all the money that, that they can make off the HeLa cell. And they don't talk about the woman that the cells came from. So we putting the human element back into the story, controlling the narrative about our family. If we can, you know, get more awareness out there um, for like, for the HPV vaccine and how that is important when in regards to cervical cancer and how that prevention can help us to eradicate cervical cancer. It's amazing to be able to have my grandfather here and to see that her cells, her, and not just herself, but she's being recognized. Since she did die from cervical cancer and we've made these advancements for the HPV vaccine because of her cell line for what she did for the world unknowingly. For her to um, finally take her place in history, where she belongs, 
and for not only her taking her place in history, but our family, we are her voices now for us to demand a spot in history and become the narrators of our own family stories.